Most of the story is told from Alexander's perspective, and I find the position of the children in this big family and the sense of safety as well as defenselessness to be heartbreaking. Mixing reality and elements of fantasy seems to come so naturally to Bergman. It's as if the film were a reconstruction of childhood memories, filling the gaps of forgotten or not fully understood events with the help of ghosts, magic tricks, and imagination. Those are words from director Lily Horvat on Ingmar Bergman's 1982 television series and film, Fanny and Alexander. Seeing Face to Movies is a podcast where each month I focus on the works of a different director or cinematographer, and each week I invite a guest on to discuss a film and the artist's filmography. I'm your host, Felicia Moroni, and we're talking about Fanny and Alexander today. So quick synopsis is two young Swedish children in the 1900s experience the many comedies and tragedies of their lively and affectionate theatrical family, the Ekdals. It stars Bertil Gruve as Alexander Ekdal, Vanilla Alwyn as Fanny Ekdal, Eva Frolin as Emily Ekdal, Alan Edwell as Oscar Ekdal, Jan Malzmo as Bishop Edward, Erlen Josephson as Isaac Jacobi. It's written by Ingmar Bergman. Cinematography by Sven Nyquist, directed by Ingmar Bergman, edited by Sylvia Ingmarsson, and music by Daniel Bell. So today my guest is Jamila Brown, and I know Jamila from one of the film clubs that we're in, and mainly through Twitter, and you're someone that I have really enjoyed becoming friends with. I love your enthusiasm for film and the type of films that you watch, and I love the little challenges you give yourself. (laughs) <laughs> to explore more films because I, I do the same thing. Uh, it's great to see someone who, you know, likes to have fun with the films that they're watching. So thanks so much for coming on for Bergman Month. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love for you to tell the listeners a little bit about, you know, your relationship to cinema and how you got into watching films on a kind of grander scale. That's like a big question. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, I guess, uh, you know, maybe a few years ago, I discovered Criterion film and mm-hmm. I just started looking into that. I did the free trial. I don't know. It was like one of the first movies on the interface. So I just thought I'd check it out. I knew Bergman was like a name. And so I was like, oh, I don't know what it was. It was was like the name or just like the picture of Alexander on the poster was really captivating. And I was just like, okay, I guess this is the one that I'm going to watch. And I didn't know at the time that that was actually his last feature. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, his last film is the first Bergman I ever watched. And I just remember watching it and just thinking, oh, this is like really beautiful. This is also kind of like Christmas movies, kind of a coming yep. age movie, kind of all these things. And like it has this weird, you have this weird feeling afterward where it's just like, I'm not really sure what that was exactly or what to take away from it. But it's just, it just stays with you. And yeah. then you just kind of pull all of these themes from it. Yeah, I just think it's excellent. I just think it's mesmerizing and beautiful. Yeah, that's that's really cool that that's not only one of the first films that you watched on the Criterion channel, but like your first Bergman, because that's a heavy yeah. hitter. It's a long one <laughs> to start yeah. off with, too. Um, whether you're watching, you know, the televised version or the film version, the film version is still like it's over three hours. So, yes. <laughs> Do you recall uh, what you would have veered towards after seeing Fanny and Alexander of his work? Um, Afterwards, I bought like a bunch of Criterion movies and I actually started Mm. watching The Magic Flute. And uh, I think it's the opera. I just like put off. Yeah. I, so I own that, but I, I never finished it. And then I watched Persona Mm -hmm. earlier this, which is the big one. (laughs) That was amazing. Um, But I haven't watched too many of his films actually but i every one of them that i've watched i love them you know i watched <laughs> our wolf for halloween mm-hmm. and that was nice. another one where it was like this is kind of perplexing it's really dreamlike i don't know what's going on but i like it <laughs> and, you know sure. it's obviously like these same kind of like themes of like marital conflict and you know religion and it's just like this is a lot this is heavy and it kind of makes you want to dive more into his work for sure I mean, I think that even if Fanny and Alexander was the only one 
that you had watched or anyone had watched, you would pretty much understand who Bergman is because it has oh, every right. single one of his <laughs> themes in this movie <laughs> that you see kind of divided through the rest of his stuff. But like, this is this end. Well, we'll get into that because that's one of the final questions. If you're ready to chat about the film itself, mm-hmm. I am because... Yeah. <laughs> As we've been saying, there's a lot going on in this one. So I guess for the audience's uh, reference here, there are two versions of this film. There was the original, what they call the televised version. It's in four episodes, essentially. Uh, he wanted to treat it as like a big film that had an intermission when it came to being shown in theaters. He was asked to cut it down. So the version that he prefers is obviously the longer one. But the, the theatrical cut is just as good. They're they're both worth watching. Obviously, one requires more of a time commitment. And mm-hmm. I will say I didn't watch it all in one sitting. Like I broke it up and I kind of treated it like a show. A couple of the episodes do feel like they are cut short, where it's like it stops where you're like, oh, this is like in the middle of something. But yeah, so for this, I had watched the televised version. Jamila watched the theatrical cut. And I think that's great because we'll be able to talk about any differences that there are were so one of the first points i wanted to cover was this is a film essentially about family and family dynamics we start the film with a huge family dinner it's christmas time and the film ends also with you know a big family dinner so we get those bookends what happens between those family dinners (laughs) is where we get real deep into these people's lives but essentially we're set up to be in the middle of their lives and These are people with money, not a a ton of money, but they have money. They're very comfortable. They have, you know, maids, housekeepers, and there's a lot of members of the family and they're all gathered together. I was going to, to start off, read a quick quote from Thomas Vinterberg, the director who was talking about this film because it's one of his, one of his favorite scenes ever. Mm -hmm. So he says the Christmas dinner scene in Bergman's film is a perfect study of character. It captures how people show the world, how they want to appear when they're around a table and how they reveal what's hidden when they're off in their own rooms so i like that quote because like i said we get the bookends but Mm -hmm. once we leave that dinner table we get deeper into each other's lives so how do you feel about just kind of on the surface level this being a film about family and as he says something like a christmas movie oh yeah i agree with that and as i was watching it i was just like like it reminds me of being with my family at christmas but at the same time Mm -hmm. I feel like Alexander and like all the kids, they're so involved, like they're so, yeah. you know, valued. I feel like there was a separation, at least with my family. It'd be like, oh, like you're the little kid, you sit at the kid table, but, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> they would have that like, like little thing thing where they were around in the circle and yeah. even the servants were involved with that. And I just thought that was very sweet. I love the uncle. What was his name? Gustav? Yeah. Adolf? <laughs> Adolf? <laughs> yeah i love he, he had that um which i never like one of the lasting images that i have from this movie i haven't seen in forever was i, I know i'm kind of jumping ahead when um no, no. Aunt, caught on fire and so i'm just yeah. like this movie and fire so i remember he had that mm-hmm. bowl with like the punch and it was like on fire and i was like oh is this like a little bit of like a foreshadowing here but mm-hmm. in in this scene it's you know it's a happy moment it's a celebration <laughs> i yeah i just loved it yeah, it's it's fun to see, you know, how close the family members are. And I'm glad that you brought up even just the kids sitting at the table with them because they have enough space that they could have just a kids table, you know, mm-hmm. because most families do. I remember growing up and there was always like a kids table that you would sit at. And then, you know, it was like a big deal when you get to graduate right? <laughs> the big table. But they include the kids in this and we see that the kids well-being is thought of throughout the entire film. Before I get into some aspects of that, I did also want to talk about there's another family in this film, and that's Edward's family. And Mm -hmm. it's a very stark contrast to the other family that, you know, Alexander's and Fanny's family. Mm -hmm. So after Oscar dies, who is Emily's husband, Fanny and Alexander's dad, Eventually, Emily remarries, and she remarries the bishop, Edward. They move in together, and they're introduced to his family that he lives in. He's surrounded by women. You know, he's got his mom there. He's got his sister there. He's got his dying aunt there. And they're all basically under the rule of his thumb. And eventually, we see that with Emily and her kids. We find out that essentially, Alexander is the first boy or man to 
be in this house outside of Edford for the longest time because his previous family, he had a wife and two daughters. So right. they butt heads immediately. But just the relationships between him and his mom and his sister and aunt is very still and dark. How do you how did you feel about when you're first introduced to them and how wild it is to see? Like it's just so cold and dark in that house. Yeah, I never thought of it the way you put it that way. But yeah, obviously it was like meant as a contrast to, Mm -hmm. you know, his home, the Ekdal home. So I was like reading and and, uh, watching videos and everything Mm -hmm. about the movie. Because uh, from what my understanding was before, this was kind of partly autobiographical. Mm -hmm. um, And I kind of wanted to understand what was meant by that. And so like apparently the bishop and... Oscar, his father, kind of like two sides of his own father, who I guess Mm -hmm. is a clergy as well, which I thought was interesting. So you have this like really sentimental side, and then you have this really like severe domineering side, which I thought it was interesting that he split them into like, it's like, oh, like they just don't belong together. It's like, no, he's a completely separate person. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I didn't notice that he had this kind of like rivalry of Alexander. I think uh, in the last scene before he dies, he even says like, oh, I fear your son, which I thought was interesting. (laughs) I loved uh, the stark difference in in the location there. And they even refer to it as like a palace, which I I, I knew it was like a castle. But when I think of the word palace, I would think, you know, it's it's lush and it's grand. And yeah. This is obviously grand, but this is like, it's just so dark and unwelcoming. And, and it's just the complete opposite of the Ectel's apartment. 100%. And, and sometimes I was like, are they referring it to that as like a, like a dig? Because like, uh-huh, obviously right. it could be very <laughs> nice, but it's like, it's not, but he's treating it like it's like this place that they should want to live. So it's uh-huh. sort of like, yeah, this is your palace in, in the quotes <laughs> there. <laughs> but right. yeah, it's yeah. interesting to see like the difference in the families and just right off the bat, right even before we meet the family, we get to the house. This man, Edward, oversaw Oscar's funeral. And then he's mm. already kind of pushing his way into the family, which is right. a weird thing. I And maybe I'm just not familiar with like the, the different levels of priesthood or if that's the right word where I was like, oh, I didn't realize that they could get married. I don't know how it is in different countries or in right. different times. I was like, OK, then I found out he was a bishop. So, OK, I guess. <laughs> uh, at that time, that that was a thing, and he'd obviously been previously married. Right. So just interesting, right off the bat, and you can see with Alexander because this story is told through his eyes. Essentially, most of it we're seeing through his right. eyes, and yeah. he's someone who had a great fondness for his father. So, right, obviously, he's going to be upset when Oscar is dying because he doesn't die right away. He has like an attack, I guess, in the theater, and yeah. he's brought home to pass. And everyone's kind of saying their goodbyes because they know what's going to happen. But Alexander cannot even go anywhere near him because he's so upset. And everyone's trying to kind of reassure him and force him and be like, you need to kind of grow up and talk to your dad and say goodbye. Yeah. Which is a lot for a kid. Like, this is his father. And as much as they're close to the kids, they're still trying to treat him like he should be grown up, not realizing he's still quite young so how do you feel about we see alexander who's just so distraught and then fanny who's a bit younger than him who's very kind of stoic and is able to sit there through all of this so the contrast between them yeah i noticed like instantly like even a few minutes before he collapsed in the theater there seemed to be like a detachment from the actor which i was like Mm -hmm. okay that's kind of strange um and i heard that like there wasn't a script for him (laughs) he's just kind of like uh, Bergman would just be like, oh, like, remember, this is your dad. And I was just like, oh, yeah. why did he do that? And I was like, well, this kind of worked, actually, mm-hmm. you know, because he's seeing his father. He's seeing his father. Like, I feel like when you see when you're a kid and you see your parents and they're being weak for the first time, it's the scariest thing. And you can't even yeah. like attach yourself to this idea of of your parent and they're crying or they were hurt. And you're just kind of like, who is this person? I can't look at this person. They're like literally a ghost, you know? And Mm -hmm. I feel like it's especially true for the parent who like, you're the same gender as them. It's like, you're, you're supposed to look up to them. And so I feel like that's why he took it even harder than Fanny Mm -hmm. and probably why he kept seeing the ghosts of his father. Yes. Yeah. That's a good point. 
because he seems to be well helena who's would be oscar's mother also sees uh, oscar's ghost uh, mm-hmm. but in a different light but it's mainly alexander who sees him just kind of watching him you know as you know the whole thing with the new husband goes down uh while they're still in that house and oscar doesn't seem to leave that house he's obviously that's where he died so that's where his ghost is residing is in that house right right but what he was he was at guy jacoby he was at his house as well oh yeah he was okay my bad (laughs) (laughs) but he doesn't seem to enter the other house Yeah, yeah that's interesting I also love the ghost makeup that they gave him. It's yeah, very, he, you know, like white <laughs> face. Yeah. I love how red the apartment mm-hmm. was. Like yes. apparently um, he told her, the designer, I want it to look like the womb, apparently. Oh. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. So like, this is like, you know, Alexander and Fanny, this is their adolescence. And then when they move into mm-hmm. the bishop's house, it's, it's like, okay, you've entered adulthood. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. I love when he does films in color because I feel like most people associate him with black and white, which is fair because most of his films are black and white. But when he does uh-huh. color, it's very purposeful. So something like A Cries and Whispers, which is in color, and like the colors are very stark. Uh, uh-huh. There's a lot of reds in that. This film has a lot of reds. But even as you're kind of venturing through Ectal House, there's different colors in each room. So like there, there was a very green room that had a lot of like foliage yeah. and like plants there. And there's like a blue room. And it uh-huh. just seemed like alive, the house, because there's a lot of love there. I mean, yeah, like that statue moves. It was alive. <laughs> mm, it's great. I just love the setting of the houses because it largely takes place in like three different houses and then the theater as well which is their their home uh Mm -hmm. essentially if we want to talk about like the kids in this i know it's it's called fanny and alexander but it's essentially (laughs) alexander right fanny is not really given too much to do in this other than just be kind of support to alexander and yeah yeah, how do you feel about that i don't know i was kind of like looking up like why did he call it that why didn't he just call Mm -hmm. it alexander i don't understand um i mean she does have a role like there are a few scenes where i'm like okay this is definitely affecting her too Mm -hmm. what i can think of is when he's like reprimanding um alexander and he hangs him and Mm -hmm. he goes in to like comfort fanny and she just like turns her head she's like i'm not I'm not mm. condoning this. <laughs> so she yeah. definitely had some characterization, but she didn't really seem to have very much. But even with that, it is from his point of view, some scenes, but I, I don't know. Just I feel like when I think about this film, I think of it more, more like it's, it's weird. It kind of reminds me of, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> no, okay. Like, well, I'm say. just going to say, it kind of reminds me of like that movie Boyhood, mm. in which it's like, it's a movie yeah. about a boy's, childhood but it's also about you know how his mom marrying mm-hmm. these terrible men and you know his his parents marriage and it's about you know the 2000s and uh, yeah. the pop culture it's like it's about all these other things it's he's kind of a footnote in in everything <laughs> and so it's it's like a coming of age but it's also just like this big statement of course now i feel that like i think when i first had seen this i saw it through more so alexander's eyes and him or his experiences solely but Uh the older i get i'm more like oh no this is a lot you know this there's a lot going on with the adults like emily is a huge role in this right uh his mother and everything that's going on there but also the other Uh siblings like oscar's siblings their aunts and uncles oh my god his one brother what was his name the one who had the terrible marriage to the german Yes. Mm-hmm. That scene, yeah. I was like, dang. <laughs> like, yes. that was a lot. That was intense. It is. It's dark. You yeah. Know? So, yeah, let's talk about we got Carl and we've got Gustav and mm-hmm. then their respective wives. So, Carl and Lydia are, are mm-hmm. the two, and he is in need of money. He's obviously severely in debt, and his mom won't give him any more money because he already owes her a lot. And mm-hmm. he's so, he's just so upset with himself. He's very depressed. And that doesn't justify the way he treats his wife at all. But this man is kind of disgusted with himself and life and he's taking it out on the one person. And he's just calling her these really ugly names and saying, you know, you can even give me a kid. And she is just so affectionate towards him and takes everything that he says and just kind of hopes, I guess, at some point that he will get better. And every time we see the two of them together, he's never nice to her. 
even when he needs something from her, he's never nice to her. The only time that we get sort of a, a slight redemption from him is when he tries to get the children back from Edward. So how do you feel about that character? Because he's someone who's very hard to watch. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad that they didn't kind of soften it up and try and make him into this really great person in the end. Like he's someone who is not very good, to be honest. Right. And and for me, I, I've only seen the theatrical version. So I, I knew that there was a part where the two brothers came for, for the kids, but I never oh, okay. saw that. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember watching the scene and yeah, like, I, I don't really think we're supposed to exactly sympathize with him, but I just remember mm -hmm. thinking, like, oh, I want more of this. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't, I guess there's something wrong with me in that I really love like romance stories, but I kind of secretly also love stories about like relationships that are just terrible yeah. and toxic. <laughs> and I find them Same. interesting. <laughs> and I like I like to watch them. I like to know, you know, what's going to happen. But obviously, th that's not like the sole part of this movie. But I, yeah, I wanted more of him and um, Lydia. Yeah, I mean, I think it is a huge part in this movie, though. Like maybe not them specifically, but there are toxic relationships throughout. We see that, and I also agree. I'm also fascinated by you know watching. I love watching people in love, but I am also fascinated by finding out. Why are these people still together? Right, yeah. Like, what drew them together in the first place? And why is it that they're still together when they clearly hate each other? So it's dark. Yeah, even the scene, I, I guess it's not in the theatrical cut, when the two brothers go to Edward and try and negotiate. Carl is not even, like, great in that scene either, because he's trying to play it up like he should be super nice to Edward and respect him, and that'll get uh -huh. Edward to say hey yeah fine you know i'll divorce emily whereas gustav is more on the angry side and just threatens the life out of him so you're more on his side because you're like you cannot treat this man with you know sympathy because he's essentially evil right then we got gustav who think deep down is a good guy who has his own problems obviously but i wanted to talk about how you read his relationship because we he does impregnate one of the the maids match right yeah but his relationship with his wife because i read it as she knows that he's he sleeps around but he loves her and or she loves him enough and she's probably doing her own thing so it doesn't matter to her i don't know if you read it that way they seem to have like an open relationship oh so you think he lets her do it too i don't know if he lets i don't know that he maybe knows or it's like an unspoken thing i couldn't tell okay. but i was like she definitely knows oh she yeah she definitely knows i, was, I, I thought it was i thought it was interesting and i was like is this just like a swedish thing is this like yeah. uh, a bourgeois thing i'm like what's going on <laughs> and then the, the part where she like is like hey so my husband's mm -hmm. gonna come see you um and then she slaps her i was like wait what are we are, are you okay and then she like smiles at her it's like what did that mean i, I was like yeah. um she's trying to tell her like oh this is happening but like don't get too close now <laughs> like i'm letting you do this it might be that exactly where it's like <laughs> you guys can have your physical relationship but at the end of the day he's still my husband i also think she was clearly drunk and sometimes if you're drunk you're yeah. overcome with like a weird slap of emotion <laughs> but it was very interesting to me where she was not wholly bothered even when he did eventually impregnate her. She just kind of treats it as like a joke. Like she doesn't seem super upset. But one of her daughters is really upset with her dad and hates him very clearly and doesn't want to be around oh, him. Oh, I must have missed that. Maybe that's not in the theatrical version. Mm, yeah. The, you get scenes with them where he's trying to like chat with her and he, he's just, she's just very upset with him uh, just in general because I guess she just obviously has no respect for him. And I guess he, she sees it as, a disrespect to her mother maybe she just doesn't realize that the bomb is okay, okay with it with for her. whatever reason yeah. <laughs> which is fair right right yeah oh i also noticed that my she kind of looks like a like a younger version of her <laughs> mm -hmm. she does so they're still intimate with each other too because they had that one scene yep. like the morning after so it was just kind of like uh is this like a healthy thing like i don't know i i thought it was <laughs> yeah except for Except for Madge specifically was like, please don't get me pregnant. And then mm -hmm. he went and got pregnant. 
It's interesting. Well, I guess two things that she says, don't get me pregnant. She obviously does eventually, but she says to him, like, I don't want anything from you. And he gets offended because right. I think he yeah. wants her to be in love with him. And he's offended that she's not. And she remains to be not in love with him. Oh, like, is that what you child. thought? See, I took it like the opposite. I took it like he was like, I'm, you're going to, I'm going to get you a house. I'm going to get you all mm-hmm. these nice clothes. And she was like, I don't want that. I just like, I, she didn't say this, but like, it just seemed like she was like, oh, I just want you. And he was like, well, mm. that's not how it's supposed to work, honey. <laughs> and he got really mad. That's, that's an interesting read too. I could, couldn't tell because I, she obviously very clearly says that, hey, I don't want all these things. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Maybe it was her. I couldn't tell if she was in love with him or not. Right. Is there more of her in the, in the televised version? Because I, I would have wanted more from her perspective. There definitely is more of her, more so as it relates to Fanny and Alexander than mm-hmm. Gustav. Because after that scene that you see where they have the discussion, she's there again, but it's more so relating to the kids. And then towards the end, when she's talking about the kids, there's a scene where she goes to visit Helena, mm-hmm. which is the, the matriarch, and she says, hey, I'm really worried about the kids. Alexander said he would write me, and I've been writing him for months, and he's only sent me one thing, and they both read the postcard, and it's very clearly not written by him. Right. It's obviously written by someone else in the house, and that's when they start kind of wondering, you know, what's going on over there, because they seem to be fully cut off from everyone and we haven't really heard from them yeah because she was obviously very close to them because they were somewhat closer in age right yeah yeah that was in my version too i just was hoping there was more because then in the end she was like i'm leaving i don't want to be here Mm -hmm. anymore i was like why but yeah i did find that you know the fact that he and his wife are still intimate also kind of healthy so it's like you do have an agreement going on Mm -hmm. there Without them, the film actually having to be like, hey, these people are in an open relationship, it leaves it up to the viewer to like suss that out on their own. I guess another huge topic of this film is obviously we've already kind of touched upon some of the love part, but there's love and death. We've got Oscar who dies, Emily remarries, the relationships between the brothers and their wives, but the concept of love and how it's viewed from each of these characters is very different because Edward genuinely thinks that he's treating these people with love it's his version of love but it's obviously a very toxic love because even when he reprimands alexander he says i'm doing this because i love you right how do you feel about his his character do you believe that he loves these people or is it that he just needs to have people in his life to control i do think it's both i do think you get more of him in that scene uh, right before he catches on fire um, <laughs> mm-hmm. at the end. And he has this long monologue about like, he says to Emily, he's like, so you feel like you wear all these different masks and mm-hmm. my mask is, is like glued into my skin, which I thought was interesting. It's like him basically professing, like I cannot be anything but this stern, yeah. like tyrannical man. Like I can't help it. And you need to do something about your son. I thought, yeah, just I love the way he gives depth into all these characters. I thought it was as I was watching it, I was like, he's basically doing what they say you're not supposed to do as a writer, which is you know the telling instead of showing. But yeah. it, it works, you know, it works so well. It's just like the characters being like, so this is who I am, and I'm like, mm. oh, this is this is so great. I just I just loved all the monologues. I love in the part where Helena was talking to uh, Mr. Jacoby. And she was mm-hmm. basically saying like, oh, yeah, like, remember, like, remember when we cheated on my husband and, <laughs> and having this like huge discussion about age and aging and how awful it is. And he's like, oh, yeah, like, I'm OK with it. And I just like I just loved all that. Yeah. It's interesting that you said that about, you know, he very much does the tell as a, he does a lot of show also, but it's mainly oh, yeah. dialogue right. based. Uh-huh. And there's not that many people who can get away with that. You, like, you really have to be a strong writer. And for a film of this length to be primarily monologues of people just uh-huh. kind of reminiscing and just kind of talking to each other or themselves out loud, but it like captivate you know your attention where you're like, I want to know, you know, what they're saying. Even Jacoby towards the end, I don't know if this is in the can't remember if this is in the film version, but when he when he brings the kids to his place 
and Mm -hmm. um, they ask him to read a story. The story goes on for quite a while. Like it's, I don't know, maybe like 10 minutes and he's just kind of talking, not directly to the camera, but like, you know, staring off. But you're kind Mm -hmm. of just hanging on every word. It's also like the actors are so good in this movie. So you want to watch everything they're saying. Yeah, that wasn't in the theatrical cut. But um, back to that, I do think it's kind of probably his background in theater, which Mm -hmm. is why he does it so well. And, yeah, you know, because of the, the visual, they're just are just so captivating. Well, we kind of talked about a little bit about, you know, the exploration of religion and how that ties to his own personal life. You know, religion has been something he talks about in almost every movie in some form mm-hmm. or capacity. In this one, it's obviously not painted in the nicest light. <laughs> so we've got the first chapter where Edward, or Edward's not in that first chapter in um, the film or the television version at all so he comes in in the second one and it changes the tone completely Uh because we're the first the first episode essentially is just the whole happy christmas dinner and Uh nothing really happens like that's negative then oscar dies in the second episode then that's when things change so we've got someone who i feel like no matter what your background is and what your thoughts are on religion i think automatically right off the bat you kind of assume that he's going to be a good guy and then he quite quickly reveals that he's not but that's like he utilizes the fact that most people are just going to assume that this guy is here to help this family Uh so edward uses that to his advantage he uses the bible to his advantage Uh he says you know you have to swear to the the bible that you didn't make this thing up. If you do, you're going to be, you know, condemned to hell. So how do you feel about him using those kind of tropes that we all know of the Catholic Church to formulate that character and how he operates? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was definitely abusive. And I don't know, from the start, I was always always like, he's a sketchy character because when, when he's <laughs> person, and I thought it was really messed up of his mom, too. <laughs> I, I have problems with his mom, but um, I'll get to that oh, later. Yeah. Uh, where she's like hey so you lied and so we sent you to the circus like uh, i'm sorry the kid lost his father yeah yeah like if he wants to live in a fellini movie let him do it like (laughs) um so like what is the problem like and then you've got this bishop saying hey you can't lie about that like what is the issue um (laughs) but then i thought it was interesting that like in in the first half you know god wasn't absent you know it, it was mm-hmm. definitely more like familial and, and the theater and, and and that was what you took away from it. But, you know, they even had their little prayers that they said with their cousins. Mm-hmm. You know, they spoke about God, but it was it was warm. It was inviting. And then, then when he's introduced, it's like God is this thing that like like he's just this drag. Yeah. Which is interesting because, you know, he's supposed to be the person who who makes you wants to draw near to god and he does the complete opposite and, you know by the end yeah. alexander's like why are you here dad he's talking to his dad goes and he's like why are you here god obviously doesn't care about you he doesn't care about mm-hmm. me and maybe he doesn't even exist yeah that's exactly that he's alexander's always just been the the voice of questioning faith right off the bat because he doesn't want to really take part in it and you got Fanny, who's still young enough, who has like a fear of saying anything bad about the church or God. And it, if you grew up with that in your life, that's just kind of inherent until you either decide to go along and continue with it or you stray for it for whatever reason. But Alexander's, whether he wanted to or not, he's kind of being forced to stray from it because he has this like domineering figure who right off the bat is combative towards Alexander. Mm-hmm. Even when they first get to his house, Alexander is reading a book and Edward's asking him what it is. Alexander doesn't want to speak to him because he doesn't mm-hmm. like this man. And he's very aggressive and he kind of h- hits him pretty hard on the back of the head as like a way to pat him to be like, oh, you know, like in a fatherly way. But it's very aggressive. And okay. there's just a tension right off the bat from the both of them. And then even the tension between like his his sister and Emily. Because his sister's trying to say, the kids need to be doing this. And the mom comes in and says, uh, Edward's mom says, the kids will need to perform tasks around the house. And Emily's like, well, if anyone's going to tell them to do that, it'll be me. Like, this is not something they're used to doing. You can't tell them. And she's like, essentially, you have no choice in this matter. You will get used to the fact that you have no choice in this matter. And that's when you're like, okay, these people are now, they have no agency 
in this at all. Right. Was there the scene in the theatrical version of when Edward asks Emily to come to the house to move there and to leave all her belongings? Yeah. 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 And then she says, I need to ask the kids because I can't make that decision for them. And Edward doesn't believe in that. How do you feel about the fact that she does treat her kids as human beings who are, you know, not something that she needs to Mm -hmm. have complete rule over? I mean, she does and then she doesn't, you know, (laughs) Um, which I think is just part of like that they're upper class. Like there's kind of Mm -hmm. I said there wasn't a separation, but clearly there is kind of a separation between the parents and the children. I feel like Alexander was closer to Maj than he was to his own mother. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was interesting that she married him. And there was always a question that I had after I watched this, like, why did she marry this man in the first place? And what I took away from it this time was like, maybe her marriage to Oscar wasn't as great as we're led to believe. You know, she says like, Mm -hmm. oh, I never felt like really happy. You know, Mm -hmm. I feel like with you, I'm I'm actually going to feel something like interesting. It is. Because at some point, she also says to Helena, she's saying she loved Oscar a lot, but a lot of the time she felt alone. I think probably because he immersed himself so much in the theater. So she probably was alone a lot of the time. She figured with Edward that she would have someone who Mm -hmm. would be with her at all times. It's just, you know, she was in a vulnerable spot of losing her husband, the father of her children. And I guess she felt comfort in this man that she figured would be safe. And obviously turns out not to be. So I know you kind of touched on earlier about your your feelings on Emily, because I'd love to hear more about her, because as things are progressing, she's trying to like diffuse the situation, tell the kids it'll get better, it'll get better. And it's like, like girl, you know, it's not like you <laughs> should see that your your children are literally miserable. And at some point she leaves the house and where, you know, the kids are asking when is mom coming back? And that's when all the more of the abuse happens. At that point, I was really frustrated with her. And I'm like, how could you leave your kids with this man? We later find out that she's done it because she's seeking help from people. Yeah. But before that, I was like, why is it? Why are you trying to convince your children that things are going to get better when there's no there's no light at the end of the tunnel there? So how do you feel about her treatment of things until things really get serious. Right. I mean, yeah, I agree with you. She obviously was like in a vulnerable place and I do have sympathy for her in that Mm -hmm. regard. And so I just kind of had to perceive it as like, so he said that this man is kind of symbolic of this severe part of his father. I feel like in a way it's also symbolic of certain religious figures who Mm -hmm abuse people and manipulate them and force them into these compromising arrangements that like basically convince them that they need them and you know really sucky church people (laughs) yeah and I just kind of had to view it that way you know Mm -hmm. yeah I think that's an interesting take because even when you said you were asking yourself, why did she marry this woman? Like, all right, why did she marry, marry this man? And I had the same thought too of like, how, what comfort did she find this man? It's also maybe because as someone who's not religious, I'm just like, it would be weird for me if someone who's like a bishop tried to approach me in like a romantic or sexual way like that. I'd be like, I don't understand what's right. happening here. And she seemed to like thirst after him. Like in those yeah. scenes where they're talking, she was just like kissing his hand. And I was just like, girl, you are down bad. Like <laughs> it, it was just, it's weird. But then you kind of, thankfully he does give you sort of hints as to how she kind of fell trapped to his love essentially. Right. And it's just very sad. And I don't know if you felt like there. there's a lot of elements of fantasy and magic throughout because we get ghosts yes. that come along. and But there's also like a, quite a few horror like scenes. Oh my so, God, yes. Because <laughs> if you I want to talk about, because for me, they were the most visually striking scenes. So one of the first ones I want to talk about, because we've already talked about Oscar showing up and like, that's not necessarily terrifying. It's more kind of, you know, fantastical looking and kind of, cool looking so if we track back just a little bit Mm -hmm. edward was previously married had a wife and two daughters we find out that they died because the two girls drowned and the mother tried to save them but was pulled down by the current Mm -hmm. alexander makes up the story about how he's seen them and they told him that you know the father murdered them we then fast forward after oscar or alexander has been beat by 
Edward, he's locked in this the attic and the two girls visit him and they tell him, hey, you, you were lying about this. So now we're going to haunt you forever, essentially. Like, that scene is terrifying. Was that in the theatrical? Please, yeah, that wasn't in the theatrical. I heard about it, but it wasn't. I was like, oh, oh my God. <laughs> You ha- I would highly recommend watching that scene because I think you'd like it a lot. It's so, it's wild that they did cut that scene from it. The thing is, I didn't remember seeing that scene. So I was like, this must not have been in the theatrical one. It's not really a spoiler because we do find out that, you know, he didn't actually kill them. Uh-huh. It was, happens to actually be a mistake. But that scene, visually, for anyone who has seen it, and you might be able to watch it on youtube that scene specifically mm-hmm. it's one of the, the one of the more terrifying scenes i've ever seen just the way it was shot and the the makeup on the two girls and they, they're kind of looming over him like you know actual monsters oh my it's God. really beautiful the way he shot that scene but it's also terrifying so we got that and then you had the mummy scene yes you had yeah so there's the mummy scene so we got aaron who lives with jacoby and he's like a puppet master essentially that ties it back to all the theater stuff that happens in this film aaron's <laughs> quite close to alexander alexander likes you know the puppets and aaron shows him the mummy that they have and the mummy breathes and is still technically alive that scene was also terrifying to me <laughs> i don't know how you felt it about was. it was i mean it was but then i was also kind of like okay this this guy just feels like scaring this kid because that's what he did yeah. earlier with the <laughs> the god puppet mm-hmm. and i guess i was more frightened by when you get to the part where he's speaking to ismail yeah which is uh did you know he was played by a woman yeah i was like that's an interesting choice and i don't know he was really creepy oh yeah and he was like in a cage I was like, oh, okay, why is he in a cage? And why are you putting that kid in the cage with him? Yeah. So, like, basically, he caused the bishop's death or helped Alexander cause it? Essentially. Yeah, that was a lot. <laughs> well, there's that scene where there's that moment in that scene where he's kind of taking Alexander's top off. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he kind of just, not fully, but he, like, removes it from his shoulders. I think so he can hold his hands to his chest. And not in... Well, right off the bat, I was like, oh, what's going to happen here? Because right. uh, I'm not really trying to. There's already been enough trauma for this child. You don't need that. Yeah. Thankfully, he doesn't go down that route. But he's essentially narrating, as it's happening, what's going on with Edward and the aunt who's been sick. And the, the aunt herself is also kind of a horrific figure. And she just looks completely dead and decaying. Right. That they're taking care of. If we go back like a little bit before that scene of the, the on fire scene, because that's a huge one. There's a scene at the the table where it's just Emily and Edward and they're talking and he's under, he's trying to be like, you know, will you ever be able to love me and we can get over this? And she's like, if the kids need to come back, I will never love you because she's mm-hmm. wanting to bring her kids back into the situation. And right. she's drinking broth and he's like, oh, can I have it? And I was like, sir, like, you're not gonna let your pregnant wife drink the broth that like why are you but go eat your own turns out that she had put some sleeping pills in there for herself because she's gonna take them herself but then when she realized that this man was gonna drink it then as he stepped away for a few seconds she added more so yeah. that aided in also him not having the physical capability of getting away from the aunt who set herself on fire and we right. get the narration from ismail on that it's just interesting the way that scene happens. It's quite close to the end of the film where you're already kind of like, there's a lot going on. Yeah. I don't know. How do you feel about kind of like the narration of that scene happening at the same time? Mm-hmm. I love the way it was editing. So it, it, it did make it seem like he's causing this to happen. Mm-hmm. Or he's helping. I think he even says like, oh, like you have the power, Alexander. I'm just like coaxing you through this. You know, I feel mm-hmm. like throughout the film, it's kind of like this alexander have this mystical power like is he kind of secretly psychic he sees all these things Mm -hmm. he sees his father or is this just his imagination is this just a kid's imagination of of all these things and then when he goes to jacoby's house there's all this mysticism going around and it just kind of erupts into this one scene when he comes to rescue them i was just confused when i watched this scene um and then i listened to the commentary i was like oh okay i still don't understand um (laughs) <laughs> where uh, he, he uh, gets him to sign this contract, I think, to kind of release the kids. 
And the bishop is like, no, I'm, I'm hit to what you're doing. He starts attacking him. He says, yes. keep away from my children. And then there's this part where he just kind of like screams and then the, the, the room gets bright. And then the mm-hmm. kids appear on the floor like he created that. But then in the next scene, they're in the um, they're in the chest. And I was yeah. like, oh, I what was the point of that? Because it's revealed that they're gone and the bishop knows that they're gone Mm -hmm. later on. So I was like, okay, what was the point of that? I am glad that you brought that up because that scene has stuck with me forever and doesn't matter how many times I see it. I will never understand (laughs) that scene. And I love it. I love the scream and I love the the brightening of the room because it's so dark and like impactful when he first runs up to the kids that take off your shoes. I'm coming back to get you. And you can see Mm -hmm. him. This man is just trying to calculate how can I get these kids into this chest? Mm-hmm. And I was on edge. Like, even this time I was watching it, like, my heart's racing. Right. I know what's going to happen, but I was still like, you know, this man's going to come back and see them running down. And it's going to be a whole ordeal. But that scene where they flash, where they see the kids lying there and Emily's like, says to Edward, don't touch them. But then yeah. the next scene right after that is them coming out of the ca- chest. It's like, I still will never understand. I don't know that we're supposed to, I guess, understand right. what that is. But it's such a weird thing. And they just never talk about it again. And it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Where you're like, you know what? This film is already set up right off the bat, essentially, to be uh, a fantasy of some sort. So mm-hmm. we're not getting that scene out of nowhere. And there's not been any sort of magical elements beforehand. So you kind of are like, well, you can do whatever you want, essentially, in this movie. But right. it's an interesting scene. And at that point, you're just like, someone needs to come and save these kids. Yeah, like you feel like him. Like you just want to scream and you want the mm-hmm. room to Right. Because especially at that point, he does have a look and and he sees Emily for a second. And I think he's just also kind of mortified for her because he can't get her out right away Mm -hmm. because he can't just kidnap her. And she's fully pregnant at that point. So it's even more difficult to get her out of it. So there's a lot going on in this film. It's heavy from right after the opening scenes to the end and how do you feel about the fact that they had to kill edward's character that was the only possible ending for that character you know he was never gonna let go they could have tried to escape but he was he was gonna find them he was gonna yeah. make their lives hell so how do you feel about the fact that the only real ending to that character had to have been death right i mean i felt bad that it was painful but it had to happen you know yeah she said she like consulted a lawyer and he basically told her like you have no uh right over your own children and Mm -hmm. there's nothing we can do this is not good no i thought things would be better for women in sweden but apparently not yeah yeah it was terrifying where you know she's just trying to think of any possibility and she says at some point to to him she's like i'm not gonna have this baby and he threatens her he's like you are going to because otherwise it's going to be hell for you know your other kids who are here with us if you don't have this child right. so it's just terrifying watching that situation and from them going into such a happy you know starting off so happy apparently you know mm-hmm. and then just what happened to her because she made that decision and it's hard not to be like well why would you marry this man because there's no way she wouldn't have married him if she knew this right so right it's just it's sad to see something like that happen to anyone are there any other parts of the film that you want to cover that we haven't chatted about so I really like the roles of women in this movie, mm-hmm. especially like we keep talking about Emily. And I feel like part of it is, you know, it was kind of expected of women to get married. You didn't want to be a widow, yeah. I guess. And then by the end of the movie, you know, she's empowered. She's like, oh, OK, I'm going to open the theater again. And she's mm-hmm. asking the grandmother, like, you should be involved. We should do this again. So I guess by the end, she kind of realized, oh, I don't need I don't need my dear beloved husband i don't need oscar Mm -hmm. to run theater like we can do this ourselves anything's better than being married to the bishop you know (laughs) and i thought that was interesting and again i love gustav and his wife i love their relationship i love by the end that ma just like hey and i'm gonna raise this baby on my own Mm -hmm. you know and maybe that's why he calls it fanny and alexander like she's in the story but (laughs) i Mm -hmm. I guess 
because basically, I guess he he had a younger sister. And then this is basically his childhood. So it's like, yeah, and she was a part of it. And women are a part of my story. Yeah. And I just liked the way everything was resolved for them in the end. Well, speaking of, actually, because I know we have kind of touched upon it, but like in terms of his other films, women are <laughs> often the focal point. And I was saying this right. in the, the, my previous episode that he doesn't often have men be the sole leads there's always going to be a woman and a lot of times it might just be only women who are in the film i think that Uh he is able to show his vulnerability through writing women and when you see the men in this the films that he writes they will have emotions but they don't know how to process them and they're bubbling up and they're just like they're so angry and they snap and we see that with the men in this film (laughs) and the only one who's able to be vulnerable is alexander because he's younger so i think that was his way also of being like this is my surrogate character but the only way i can show this is through the eyes of a child like i can't do it having an adult man be the lead in this this film right yeah, yeah, that's an interesting point. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. Well, I think, you know, without trying to, sometimes when you over talk a film, right? you get yeah. too deep and you're <laughs> like, okay, we're kind of ruining it. So I think we covered at least our thoughts on the film, the thoughts on the characters. So I'm ready to switch to the last portion of the show if you are. Yeah, I'm ready. We'll go into the end credits and I have saying two questions for every person who comes on. So the first one is, if someone were to ask what Bergman film they should start off with if they've never seen a Bergman film, which film would you recommend they start off with and why? I'd recommend this one. Uh, yeah. This was my first one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I definitely wanted to watch more afterwards. I've heard it say, and I think this is wild, but yeah, it makes sense that this is definitely one of his lighter films. So mm-hmm. if you want something lighter, if you want something lighter, but also darker especially around christmas time there's a lot of overly sentimental stuff this is something interesting mm-hmm. to watch and i i definitely i definitely am going to watch the televised version i think that would be fun like a little advent thing like oh let's watch the mm-hmm. first episode and watch the second episode and lead up to christmas <laughs> for sure i think that's the best way to do it like kind of just treat it like you're watching an episode per day leading mm-hmm. up to it because you can you can watch it all in one, but like it's a lot to sit through because it's a lot. Like the first episode is like an hour and a half, and then the other ones are just under or over an hour. Mm-hmm. So it's like over five hours of footage, and you're gonna feel exhausted by the end. But if you break it up the way they've broken it up for you, you'll I think you'll get more out of it, and I think you're gonna like it a lot, and you'll get to see that the scene with the sisters, <laughs> which I think you'll yeah. really like. <laughs> Yeah, I think this is a good place to start. I always say, I usually say something like this or a wild strawberries where they are the lighter ones, but they mm-hmm. still touch upon the dark elements that he likes to explore, but you're not going straight into something like harrowing, like the cries and whispers or even like seven seal, which I think is usually quite heavy to start off mm-hmm. with. So this gives you a well-rounded vision of what he has to offer. So. Mm-hmm. Second question, you don't have to just give me one answer, but if you have one answer, that's also great. But if you're going to pair this film with another film and you're making a double bill, which film are you pairing it with and why? Is there a theme to it or, you know, same genre or where? what's the avenue you're going? All right. So I like I knew this question was coming up and I was like, yeah, (laughs) at a loss. (laughs) Like, no, like, like I didn't want to think of something stereotypical. And then as I was watching it, I was like, oh. Yeah, I have so many. Like, uh, mm-hmm. I mentioned Boyhood a while yeah. ago. But even, like, if you were wanted to go with, like, a Christmas theme that's also, like, centers on marital conflict, and it's also Kubrick's last feature, uh, I would go mm. with Eyes Wide Shut. Nice. And then another one I thought of, just because it reminds me so much of it, uh, because of, like, the mystical, kind of creepy energy, the, the like warm photography uh with the double life of veronique mm, um, okay nice yeah, yeah very dreamy mm-hmm. and then like the second half of it is just very scary death yeah <laughs> <laughs> for sure i guess an obvious one would be just any Charles dickens adaptation as well yeah of a, a christmas carol of course those are all great i hadn't even thought of uh eyes wide shut for this but i can definitely see that that would be an interesting double bill but even just kind of like the the settings Mm -hmm. are very similar that would be interesting boyhood is when i i've only seen that once 
And then when it came out, I saw it in the cinema, but I haven't seen it since. I've been meaning to rewatch it because mm-hmm. I did enjoy it a lot. I know not everyone loves it, but I feel like Link Later is like so inspired by him, especially oh, yeah. with like the before movies. Like, oh, oh he's yeah, really got those monologues down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's also a really great writer, so that helps on Mm -hmm. his front so i i thought of four different ones and it kind of came up to me with each episode so i would make a quick note you know different themes so the first one of the first episode because it's a lighter and it's more of like a family film essentially of like surrounding around dinner tables and eating so the first one i thought of was actually and i've already used this film in a previous episode for a double bill but i'm gonna use it again it was hannah and her sisters uh which is the Woody Allen film. And there's a lot of centering around families and gathering for holidays and all that. So it's definitely a lighter version of this. And definitely that film would not reflect (laughs) the rest of this film at all. But if you just saw the first episode, that would make like a good double bill for that first episode. And then the next two, I went through the theme of films that are told largely through the eyes of a child um so the first <laughs> one was Pizit mama which is the silenciama film that came out right a couple of years ago and that's about two young girls and we do see some adults but it's mainly just them kind of going through their lives and there's another one that i i do recommend to people because it is a really good movie but it will deeply upset you so it's called panette and it's a french film from 1996 by jacques doyon and Okay. I saw this on Mubi a couple of years ago. It's about a young girl. This is no spoilers. It's like in the synopsis. A young girl who has lost her mother in a car accident. They were in the car together, but she survived. And it's a movie that I think is very good. But even when I was looking up the film just to get what year it was, I already got upset just looking at the stills. Like it, <laughs> It's so sad it's so unbelievably sad but the girl in that she's four years old and it's the best acting you'll ever see not even just by a kid like by anyone it's insane so it's i don't know how easy it is to find now but it was on movie oh you gotta send me that title yeah i I will i will i'll send (laughs) it to i'll dm it to you uh but yeah be prepared to like you would have to be a monster human being not to have this affect you Like, oh my actually. God. <laughs> and the last one I thought of because for the last final chapter, because it gets very kind of horror like and the way it's shot is quite different from the rest of the film. I thought of uh, Tarkovsky's The Sacrifice. And in that there's a huge thing with the house that goes on fire. So it just kind of reminded me of him and the the ant when they're on fire and just the way that it was shot. So watching this and The Sacrifice might make you want to be in a dark room for a few hours oh afterwards. God. But... <laughs> If you're up for that, then I would recommend that. Those are my four. That's more than enough uh, recommendations from me. But I right. think that was that was Fanny and Alexander. Thank you so much for coming on to tackle it with me. I really Thank appreciate you. it. I appreciate it. This was such a great discussion. Seeing Faces in Movies is an official podcast of the Royal Film Club. It's hosted and edited by Felicia Maroney with intro music by Lamar Walker. If you like what you heard, let us know at seeingfacesmovies.com or send us an email at seeingfacesmovies at gmail.com. While you're at it, please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to your podcast. And stay tuned for our next episode on Wild Strawberries. <laughs>